Hey, nerdy knitters, welcome to another edition of the Knitting 411 live stream podcast where we discuss your knitting questions. We have a few questions lined up today, some that are really interesting, and I had to do some digging to find some techniques and methods, so we're going to explore that today. But we'll start with our knitting news. Let me switch over to our slides. I don't know if you can remember all the way back to the uh, last Olympics that were in Tokyo. If you remember one of the swimmers from Great Britain, Tom Daly, um, he was knitting at the Olympics. And I'm sure if you are in any Facebook groups or Ravelry or any other knitting websites online or communities, then you probably saw pictures of him. He knit a little pouch for his uh, gold medal that he won in his event. And he also knit this sweater while he was there at the Olympics because he wanted something to remember that by. So he popped up in the news again this week. Um, he has a website by tomdaily.com. You'll find a link for it down in the video description box that um, has a bunch of knitting kits for all different knitting levels. So if that's something that interests you, you can explore that. It has a little more about his knitting journey. He started knitting in March 2020. So that's pretty impressive that he was knitting this cardigan. Um, a silk, I think, that he designed himself. But anyway, if you're interested in looking at the knitting kits that he is produced or has produced, then you can check out his website by TomDaily.com. So I'll share a little bit about what I've been knitting this week, our little podcasty bit of the segment. Um, I just sent off one design that will be in, in an upcoming publication in February. So I don't have that to share. That's all finished and sent off. I just have to get the pattern finished and get that emailed this week. Um, but I do have a few things on my needle. So I'll switch to my overhead camera so you can see those. I'm using this wonderful yarn. This is um, Harrisville Designs. Their Shetland yarn. I've got eight different colors of this. It's a really, um, it's a two ply, fingering weight, beautiful colors. It has, it's not so, it's not itchy so much as textured. Like it feels tweedy. I don't know if that's the right word for it since there's no tweed in it. It's just got really nice texture to it and lovely colors. You can see this is a little swatch I've done. I'm working on a tam. And those are some of the lovely, lovely colors. They're really nice. I've got three different shades of this gold and brown, and then three different shades of green. And then this really, really pretty red. Um, I cannot remember the names of these colors, but they're just absolutely lovely. And it's lovely yarn. And I just love the way, like, it's perfect for stranded color work. It's just, it's lovely for it. So I'm really excited. This is the first time I've used this yarn and it's just really nice. And um, I'll show you some progress on my color adventure shawl. I think I showed this last week. This is going to be a top down triangle shawl. It's a self striping yarn from Gage Dye Works. I don't have the label here, so I can't show you the label, but it's their whiskey in a teacup colorway, which has these different sections of long, um, self-striping but it's really wide sections but it's worked so that in this top-down triangle shape each section is the same width so every time the color changes I change to a different stitch pattern I had four different stitch pattern well stockinette and three more that I was using so every time the color changed I would switch between stockinette or one of the other stitch patterns but I finished the last repeat and now it's this the other half of the yarn is all gray. So I'm trying to figure out what I want to do with that. If I want to continue doing all of these different sections or introduce something with a little more interest. So we'll have to see what I'm going to come up with for that, I guess. But I'm making good progress. And it's just really lovely yarn. This is also a fingering weight. I think this one is their sock yarn, which is a merino cashmere blend, I believe. I don't have the label, so I, and I forgot to check just before this. So that's coming along nicely. And I'll probably continue working on that over my Christmas break. And then the last thing is my um, master knitting program. My last project is the Aran sweater and the yarn. I had I had gotten a few um, skeins of bare wool of the Andes worsted from Knit Picks, and I had swatched and then I cast on and then their yarn was out of stock for a long time, but I didn't want to get a new yarn because then I would have to re-swatch and do everything all again. But their yarn is finally back in stock, so I bought enough to finish this sweater. 
there's one skein of it there. And what's really nice is um, since it's 100% wool, I'm just spit splicing the ends. When I run out of one ball, I just spit splice with the other. So I'm just going to have a few ends to weave in when this is finished. And I'm still working on the back. You can see some of it here. That's the center motif right there. And then it's got rope cables on either side and then two more cables. And then each side has these other twisted cables with bobbles and then finished with some moss, not moss stitch, box stitch. I think there's another or double seed stitch. There's a few different names for that. So that is the back. And I really like, I spent a lot of time on the ribbing, getting that just right. I wanted some of this, the cables to flow right down into the ribbing. And I think it came out really nice down there. So <laughs> I'm really pleased with that. I have a few more repeats of the pattern to go before I can, I'm just gonna bind off straight across the top. I will reduce some of the cables to so I don't get any cable flare. But that will be finished and then I can cast on the front and the sleeves. And this is my big Christmas project. Once um, all everything else is designed and sent off and sent where they need to be, I'm going to be focusing on this so I can get this off in the mail. So I've had it, let me see, I bought the Master Knitting Program. I bought level three for my Christmas gift last year. So it will be nice to have it all done and ready to go in the mail, hopefully by January. That's fingers crossed. I can ship it off. Then I have to wait probably two or three months before different people will check my work and then they'll send it back to me and I will have some things to redo and re-swatch and hopefully not my sweater. <laughs> I really don't want to re-knit that again. So I'm trying to be very careful with it and make sure it's really done well. But then I will get that sent off and we shall see. So sometime next year, I will be officially done with the Master Knitting Program. So it's been a lot of work, but it's been really nice. I've learned so much through that program, but I highly encourage it if it's something where you want to really explore your knitting and understand what is happening with all of those stitches and the different yarns and your needles and how everything works together to create beautiful things. Okay, but I'm going to switch back to my other camera because that's everything I've been knitting um, right now. But I do want to show you a recommended resource. I love to show you a new book that you can put on your nerdy, nerdy, nerdy knitting bookshelf like I have behind me. I love collecting resources and books to help me learn more about knitting. And I have a new one to show you. So let me switch over to that camera and get my yarn out of the way. This book. Um, Seed Stitch Beyond Knit One Pearl One by Rosemary Drysdale. Now, I really like Seed Stitch. It's just a really pretty textured pattern. And I hadn't really thought of the different ways that you could use Seed Stitch. But this book really explores the many, many different ways. And it's split into a few different categories in the introduction and then like it talks about the anatomy of seed stitch and then using it with color work designing different seed stitch patterns and then a, a selection of swatches that are based on seed stitch and then plenty of projects cowls and throws and hats and bags pillows wrist warmers all that use um, some version of seed stitch See, there's some really lovely projects here. I really like that towel that's on the cover, that checkerboard seed stitch pattern. So let me flip through and... So it really discusses, it's, it's, it's so interesting, this one, what we would call simple, basic knitting stitch pattern, but just to take that pattern and really dive into understanding how it works. And then she's got sections here on knitting it in the round and then increasing and maintaining the pattern, which can be difficult, or decreasing and maintaining the pattern. And then talking about different yarn weights and how seed stitch looks in each of them. Even that's really interesting. The larger the yarn, the, the more textured and chunky it looks. It's just a very interesting, interesting look. And then um, some of the swatches that she has in here that introduce other colors or just different ways to use seed stitch. It's really an interesting look and you can see each of the swatches has big color photographs and the written instructions and charts and then lots of swatches in here and then patterns like the wristers and then it has all of the instructions you would expect to see for patterns. And then in the back, she even has, let me see, 
Let me back here. Um, seed stitch and moss stitch all charted out. So you could sort of um, diagram your own design over the top of it. And then some basic things that skill level, yarn type, abbreviations, things like that. So this is a really, really interesting book. I love how she just took this one stitch pattern and really explored it. I thought that was really interesting. So I'm going to be reviewing that book for the Knitting Guild Association, their next issue of Cast On Magazine. So I'm looking forward to that because I love knitting books and I love writing about knitting books. So that will be lots of fun. So that is everything I've been knitting. Let me switch back over to this screen and talk about knitting questions. So our last live stream two weeks ago, the community question that we closed with was asking if you had been knitting any gifts this year. I am not, surprisingly. It's very strange. That usually I have a few gifts going on, but I just haven't, nobody really requested anything this year. So I'm just doing my own knitting, which is nice because I can really focus on the master knitting sweater and get that finished and sent off pretty soon. But these are the responses from everybody else who voted. Lots of people are knitting and you can see these are some of the projects that they're knitting. Let me get this out of the way so you can see. There we go. Okay. Sorry about that. Technical issues back here. So Marilyn's knitting mittens, a masuga nut, socks and blankets, and she might not stop there. Depends on what her children need or ask for. And she says, I love her, her last comment that she should have started last year on December 26th for this year. So if you knit gifts and you have a lot of gifts to knit, maybe you need to start that early too. And Mad Happy is knitting lots of hats. Um, Fawn Jenkins is knitting a wrap for her daughter. Kaz is knitting a table runner. So if you're knitting any gifts, why don't you pop into the chat and tell me what you're knitting this week? And if you're not, tell me what other things are on your knitting needles. I would love to hear what is on your knitting needles this week. And Hope at Painted Fox Gifts is knitting hats for a charity tree at church. I love that. Knitting for different organizations and charities is just a wonderful way to use our skills to help others too. And Sista's Knit and More, all newborn baby outfit for her grandchild and chemo hats for her dad who's battling three types of cancer. So oh, keep her in your thoughts. That must be a very difficult time for her family. But... <clears throat> Gifts are always a wonderful, appreciated thing. Well, hopefully. Sometimes we hear stories of people who don't appreciate their knitted gifts. But if you knit any this year, I hope that they are appreciated by your loved ones. Okay. We had a few questions submitted um, between last live stream and this live stream. And if you have any knitting questions you'd love to discuss, you can pop them into the chat and we'll discuss them today as well. Um, Fawn wants to know about a wrap that she's knitting for her daughter. It's in garter stitch, and she was wondering if she should add an edging to the garter stitch shawl, or if it would be fine just to leave it just to have it self edge. Now, garter stitch is one of those things. There we go. Garter stitch is one of those things where you do not need to add an edging. Of course, you can if you have some pretty, like you want to do an I cord or some sort of slip stitch edge or anything like that just for decoration you can do it, but you don't need to do it because it will lay flat on its own. So if you're adding an edging just to keep it from curling, like you would need for something that's primarily stockinette, you need some kind of an edge stitch to keep that stockinette edge from curling to the front and to the back and up and down. Every side of stockinette will curl in some manner. But with garter stitch, you don't have to do it. It's going to lay flat, but you can if you just wanna add a decorative edge like a slip stitch edge is really nice. Just that one stitch along the edge that sort of runs up like a chain that can be really pretty in garter stitch or an I cord. If you did, if you slipped three stitches, you could have like a little I cord edge. Um, I'm sure there's others I'm not thinking of, or if you do like a yarn over knit two together type thing, then you can have like sort of an eyelet looking edge. There's lots of different ways you could add something decorative but it's not necessary for the project to lay flat now if you're knitting something or you're designing something on your own and just knitting on the fly and you want to know if you 
need an edge stitch, the thing to remember is um, the combination of knits and purls. With stockinette, all of the knits are on one side and all of the purls are on the other. So they're completely separated. And that's what causes that curling because the shape of the stitches um, isn't the same. Like the, the front of the stitch and the back of the stitch, just the way the knit and the purl are created, that is what causes that curling. But if you think of a fabric like garter stitch or seed stitch, moss stitch, rib patterns, knit one, purl one, knit two, purl two, any of those, you're getting an even distribution of knits and purls on every single row in all of those stitch patterns. If you think about that with garter stitch, you're getting knit stitches on one side, but then on the, when you turn your work, you're knitting again. So those stitches become purl stitches on the front and on the other side of the work. It's hard to describe, but I think if you're knitting, you can see what I mean. That's why you get all of those ridges. So that lays flat and seed stitch, you're constantly changing between knits and purls. So there's a complete even distribution of knits and purls and rib patterns the same. Um, if it's knit one, purl one, knit two, purl two, that's an even distribution on both sides. But in stockinette, they're not evenly distributed. All of the knit stitches are on one side. All of the purl stitches are on the other. And that's what causes the curling. So all of that to say, if the project you're working on has an even distribution of knits and purls, if there's some kind of texture going on where the stitches are pretty much even, you you're, it's not mostly knit stitches, um, you got a lot of purl stitches going on in that fabric too, then it's most likely going to be just fine and it will stay flat. But if the background is primarily stockinette where all of your knit stitches are on one side and all of your purl stitches are on the other, say you're doing something with some eyelets or something like that, that's not enough to keep the stockinette from curling. The background of that stitch pattern is still primarily stockinette because we've divided our knits and our purls. We're not distributing them evenly on both sides of the fabric. So I hope that makes sense. If you're working on something, then you can look at the stitch pattern and probably figure out just by looking at it, whether it's something textured or something where the knits and the purls are divided and that background is that smooth stockinette. That is when you need to add something along the edge to keep that from curling. Okay, so our other knitting question was just a very simple one. Where do you get your supplies? Um, I, I'm on a budget, like most knitters that I know. Um, so I shop locally. I've got a couple local yarn shops here where I live. And I, I like to save up my money and, and um, shop there when I can. But I also like to shop at big box craft stores like Michael's. And they have, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, like Peyton's wool is hundred percent wool. They carry that locally here and different sock yarns, things like that. Of course, you'll find lots of acrylic and some cotton and things like that. But, um, I just like to go and see what's new. And then I like to look for natural fibers as much as possible. Just, I prefer them, prefer to knit with them and I prefer to wear them. Um, I do use acrylic quite often for gifts and things like that, where I know that the person that is going to have the item is definitely not going to want to hand wash, lay it out flat to dry, and all the things that we do for our own hand knit garments. They're going to want something easy to care for. Um, but so on a budget anyway. So when I'm shopping online, I like to use Knit Picks because they have a, a great variety. They have just such a good variety of more inexpensive, like their Knit Picks Wool of the Andes Worsted. I use that a lot. It's very inexpensive, but it's a nice wool yarn, comes in a lot of different colors. Um, but they've even got more expensive, pretty things. Um, not that the inexpensive ones aren't pretty. I don't mean that. Some hand painted, you know what I mean? They're, they're, they're slightly more money because they, they take more work to um, make that kind of yarn. The hand dyed yarn is obviously going to be more expensive no matter where you purchase it. But they have a good range. And even that more expensive yarn is probably less expensive than you will find in other places. So Knit Picks is like that gateway for those really nice yarns. You can try them out at a lower price point and they've got lots of tools and notions. So I, I generally, that's the first place I shop because the shipping is good when they ship to Canada as well. Um, so I have that to consider. I need places that the shipping isn't too outrageous where I'm in Canada. Um, and I also like Lovecrafts. That's another great location. I like that they have so many different brands so I can 
look at a lot of different things and it's not trying to buy, you know, just one brand from one website and another brand from another. I can get a whole bunch of different things and put them in my cart all at once. So if you're looking for more budget friendly places to shop, then those are my two recommendations. I like to shop there, but I know I am blessed with, um, with, with some of the designing I do that I get some very lovely yarns that I might not buy for myself unless I really, I do like to save up and splurge once in a while, save my birthday money or my Christmas money and splurge on something that I've been wanting. But for the most part, I just, I like my inexpensive wool and I use that quite a lot. So I hope that's helpful. You are welcome, Fawn. I'm happy to answer your question. Okay, it doesn't look like anybody else has any questions right now. So let us go back to our presentation. So those are all of the questions that were submitted. And we've been discussing the different ways to join knitted fabric. And there's been so many different ways. We've had mattress stitch, which is probably my favorite way to seam finished pieces, but we did look at backstitch and overcasting and slip stitch crochet as some other options. And then we looked at what you can do to join um, pieces where the stitches are still live. You haven't bound them off yet. So we looked at the three needle bind off and we looked at grafting. I don't think we did the bind off seam, which is something I found in Vogue Knitting, but if you have that book, you can look that up. But then while we were discussing all of that, Emily had another question. Um, about joining stitches and rows when they haven't been bound off first. Now we have talked about stitches, how you can join stitches to stitches when they're not bound off, when you would use the kitchen or graft or the three needle bind off. But there are methods for joining bound stitches or just the edge stitches to stitches that have not been bound off yet. They're still live on the needles. I really had to explore this question because I hadn't done it myself. So we are going to switch to the overhead camera and I'm going to show you how that works. Okay, so I've got two swatches here. Now, Emily's question, let me get my yarn is all stuck up here. Okay. Um, was about bound. Um, let me see, what was your question again? <laughs> to go look when stitches how to join stitches and rows when they're still live well rows it doesn't really matter because i mean well you're just going to use that edge stitch anyway there's nothing that has to be bound off let me zoom in a little bit is that still blurry it looks clear here tell me if it's still blurry and i can try to adjust the camera um so there's nothing, no live stitches along this edge. Obviously the stitches would be here, but then we, I left the stitches live here and I've blocked this acrylic. So those stitches aren't going anywhere. So I could take them right off the needle. Um, and I've already started. And what you're doing is sort of a graft. You're going to create another row of knitting. Now you're not gonna wanna pull this tight as you're creating it because you want it to look just like the stitches underneath. Now. Um, everything good? Okay. Thank you, Fawn. Um, I'm using a different color, obviously, so you can see it, but you would want to use the same color. So it would look just like the stitches under there. And this is sort of like a combination of, um, grafting and mattress stitch. Now, if you, uh, remember our discussion about mattress stitch, or if you weren't here, mattress stitch is where you pick up the running bars between the two stitches. Um, but in the resources I found for this, I think it was probably to avoid the bulky seam because if you're coming in a whole stitch in, especially in this bulky yarn, you're going to have a bulkier seam. So the resources I found only use half a stitch. So that's what I'm going to demonstrate here. But the stitches part is very, very simple. You go down this, the last stitch you were in right here, you can see that's where the yarn is coming out. So I'm going back down into that stitch and up through the next stitch. And that's how, and of course your needle, your, your knitting needle might still be in there. Mine are staying in place. So I just pulled the whole needle right out. So you would pull your yarn through and remember you're trying to make this look like another row of knitting. 
just like those stitches. So you want to be careful of your tension and try to get them about the same size. And then you move to this piece up here and you would go where you came out of before. And there's the yarn right there. And then you would look for the running bar that's right in the center of the stitch, actually. The stitches are running this way, and that is that edge stitch right along the edge. It's pretty wonky, but you're going right into the center of that stitch and picking up the running thread right in the middle. I don't know why you, uh, you couldn't go between the two stitches and pick up that running bar instead. The resources I found, though, they, they picked up that half stitch, and I, I'm guessing it's to keep that seam from being too bulky. So you pull that through. And then you would go back to the live stitches on the bottom. Oh, that's a bit tight. Yep, this one I tightened up too much. So I'm going to loosen it up a little, pull some of that yarn through. Okay, so then you go back to your live stitches back where your yarn is coming out and you go down into that and up through the next stitch. And that's really, that's all there is to it. It's not difficult, but you do have to, I think if you understand mattress stitch, you'll understand, you'll have a better understanding of this. But if you're not quite sure, then knit up a few little swatches and practice. So this would be used when um, you are joining, say a sleeve, to the the shoulder of a sweater this would be the shoulder of the sweater right here and your sleeve stitches you just left them live and you're joining them this way now i'm not sure when i'd actually use this i think i would prefer to bind them off and then join them that way it just seems like it would be a little sturdier but if you're ever in a situation where you do need to join live stitches to the rows then this is how you would do it. The other thing to remember is your stitch and your row gauge, because if you've ever seen a pattern that would tell you to um, seem like five, seven rows to every five stitches or something like that, that's your stitch and row gauge. And usually the pat it's the, the designer's stitch and row gauge, and they're using that. But the best ratio is your own stitch and row gauge. So if you've knit a swatch, you can check that. If not, just take the measurements from your project. Um, a lar That's basically a big swatch anyway. You can just knit or measure a large area and figure out your stitch and row gauge to the inch. Not that I would measure one inch. I would measure like six or eight or more inches. Um, I did a quick one here, and I think it was about three and a half stitches to five rows. So as I'm working across putting these, putting this together, then every three or four stitches, I'm going to have to go under an extra bar here because I want to keep them about the same ratio. Um, so there's three stitches right there. And in that we can see there's one, two, three, four, there are about five stitches in that same area. If I go one for one, that's going to stretch this part out and it's going to pucker this part up. So I need to make sure I'm using that ratio. So for every three stitches I'm creating, I'm working through five of the rows over here. hope that makes sense. Um, so I, I, I've worked on that one. Now I need to come back down here and back here. So let's say I just did a couple. That was a couple of stitches, I think. So I'll pull it through. And then on the next one, I, I would go back down where that one is. But instead of coming up under one bar, let me get back here in the light, I would come up under two bars to compensate for that extra row in there. And that is how you would graft those together. Just down that stitch and up through that stitch, and then you would just keep going. But while I was looking at for this one, which is very interesting, I discovered that you can also do this for stitches to stitches. So in this case, you don't have to worry about compensating for stitch and row gauge since you're working one stitch to another stitch. 
Now this is, I'm not sure when you'd actually want to use this, but you might at some point. But these stitches have been bound off and these stitches are still live. But it's sort of the same, similar process. I've already started so you can see it here. And this is another one you wouldn't want to zip it up. This wouldn't be for a closed seam. So you want that to look about the same. You want those stitches to look seamless across here as you're creating them. So you have to be careful of your tension and make sure they're looking about the same size as the stitches above and below. So you come down to the stitch you just came out of down here and up through the next stitch. Pulling it so it's about even. And then for the piece on the top, you're going between the stitches. There's the stitches, that little V right there. We're coming to one side of it. And once you get going, then it's easier because it's just where your yarn was before. You're just going back in there, coming up under both legs on either side of the V, just like that. And then you go back down here through those stitches and through just like that. I came out through this one, so I'm going back in and then coming up through the next stitch. Trying to get them as even as possible to the stitches around them. And then back down where I was before and then up under both legs of that stitch right there. So that would be how you would graft a bound off edge to an edge that is still live. So like I said before, don't zip it up. This isn't like a, a regular seam that you would zip up. You're grafting your stitches together. So you want, obviously you would use the same color yarn or not if you want that decorative edge. And then you would have a seamless edge right there. So not quite sure when you'd want to use this because if you're doing two shoulders then you've either bound off both of them or you haven't bound off either one. But if you ever run into an issue where you are working bound off stitches to live stitches, this is how you would do it. There, I hope that was helpful. Oh, I'm sorry, that was still blurry. I'm not sure why that's happening. Everything looks clear here. Hopefully you could still see what was going on. Um, if anybody has any knitting questions, you can pop them right into the chat and we can discuss them right now. I think that wraps up our discussion for the many ways to join knitted pieces. And surprisingly, there are a lot of ways to do that. So um, I recommend Vogue Knitting, their ultimate reference book, this book right here. Um, they have a really good finishing section, really clear illustrations and steps to walk through a lot of these methods um, or just put them right into your search bar. If there's a certain method you'd like to explore, see if you can find a YouTube video or another reference online for it. Um, but those are two places to start or go back and watch past live streams and you can see some demonstrations for those methods. It doesn't look like, um, let me see, Gary, could this technique be used with the round dishcloth? Oh, it could, yes. I bet, yes, I think that would be a fabulous way. I'm gonna to have to do that now. That is a great suggestion, Gary. I don't know if anybody's familiar with round dishcloths where you're using short rows and creating that really pretty shape. You're binding off a few and, um, okay. Cause sometimes like you would cast on normally and then you would bind off at the end and then use a seam to seam the two pieces together. Or you could do a provisional cast on at the beginning, which I find is a bit fiddly and then leave live stitches and graft the two ends. But this would be a great thing. You could do a regular cast on, but then instead of binding off at the end, yes, you could definitely do this. You could graft those live stitches to that bind off or that cast on edge. Great suggestion, Gary, thank you. I'm definitely going to try that. And if anybody tries that, if you try that, Gary, then let me know how it works out for you. That's really, that's great. Great way to use that. Oh, good. I'm glad. <laughs> That's a great dishcloth. That's one of my favorites. The first, well, I, I knit a few and gave them to my mother-in-law and she wouldn't use them as dishcloths. She was trying, she was putting them around the house and using them as doilies. And I had to convince her, no, those are for washing your dishes. She thought they were just too pretty to, <laughs> to put in her sink, but 
she finally came around and she uses them now. They're just a nice size, that little, I don't know, they fit your hand really well, that round, round dishcloth. Well, I think that's everybody's questions. We do have a community question for um, our next live stream, but that won't be happening until January. I'm not sure of the date, um, but I will post on the community tab um, when I have when I'm I'll post a thing when I'm asking for questions for the next live stream. But I'm taking a break for the rest of December for the holidays. Oh. Um, so, uh, you can look when you're, you can look in January in early January, not the very first week, but I think the second week of January will be back for the live stream. But, um, I want to focus on working on our, our fixing your knitting mistakes program and, um, not having the live stream for the next few weeks will help me focus on that instead. But I do have a question, our community question for our first live stream in January. If you want to pop over and answer it, there's a link for it down below. Um, tell me how you learned to knit, whether it was a family member or a friend, or if you learned from a book or watching videos online or whatever method you've used. You can see we already have some votes, but you're welcome to go vote on that. Um, and also there's a link for if you still haven't voted for the poll for the course that I'm going to be working on why we're not doing the live stream so I can focus on that. Um, Your mother-in-law did the same. Oh, but with the dishcloths, yes. I don't know what it is about those dishcloths. They're just too pretty sometimes. <laughs> okay, so that is it for, doesn't look like anybody else has any questions. Um, here we go, move this along, my technical things here. Okay, doesn't wanna move forward on my screen, so we will stop it right there. But it's been wonderful chatting with you. So I hope you have a wonderful holiday season and lots of wonderful knitting time while you're cozying up in your house. Um, and we will see you back here in January for the first episode of our new season for the Knitting 411 podcast. So until then, happy knitting.